Today, our first talk of the day is Beyond Old Text, What Every Project Should Know About Accessibility by Nick, Denise Paoluki. Paolucci. Um, Paolucci, I'm sorry, I'm hopeless with pronunciation. Denise is the co-founder of Dream With Studios. As you can see, she's still very involved in Dream With. And that's a blogging and community platform for those who don't know. She, has also ser she also serves on the Board of Directors for the ADA Initiative, which is a fantastic non-profit organisation working to improve the repre representation of women in open stuff, which, I ha which I've looked up the website and it looks like a great organisation. So thumbs up. So let's give a warm welcome to Denise. Thank you for coming. I am Denise Pellucci and I am here speaking about web accessibility for the 21st century. You know, the name in the program is Beyond Alt Text, but I figured that I would, uh, you know, spice it up a little bit. Um, first off, I want to reassure you that my slides, my resources, my examples, they're all downloadable at the end of the talk, so you don't have to be sitting here and trying to frantically write down, because I'm going to be taking you through this very quickly. <laughs> uh, I also want to apologize, I'm still uh, recovering from a bit of a cold, so you know, if I have to stop and cough, I really apologize. So let's begin with, what do we mean by accessibility? People throw that word around a lot. You want to make your website accessible. Is this accessible? Do you meet the accessibility guidelines? Well, you know, we talk a lot about accessibility, but what does it mean? And there are a lot of different definitions for it. If you ask 10 different groups or organizations, you'll get 20 different definitions. The definition that we're using for the purpose of this talk, accessibility is about making websites work with assistive technology and not against it. And, you know, there are a lot of people who would disagree with that definition. Um, accessibility and disability rights um, activism, you know, a somewhat contentious field sometimes. But that's what we're going to use for this talk. So when we talk about web accessibility in particular, you wind up with, you have a lot of different standards. And if you're here sitting in this talk, you probably have at least heard of these standards once or twice before. Uh, there's the World Wide Web Consortiums, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Uh, there's Web AIM, which is an independent project that comes up with essentially a bunch of ways to implement the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. If you're in the United States, there's the uh, Section 508 standards. If you're in in the UK, I think they've just come up with a, a new uh, standard um, 8857 or something like that. And it's hard to get information on that unless you actually give the British Standards Board money for the copy of the standard. <laughs> <coughs> so we've got all of these competing standards. Um, most of them do happen to agree with each other, which is good because, you know, when you have your standards and they agree, that's, uh, you know, one problem solved right there. But there is still a problem. This is the problem. You're squinting at that right now. I can see you squinting at it. This is uh, the um, W3C's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I apologize, I could not make it larger because if I made the text any larger, you would have gotten this much of the standard except instead of this much. This is one tiny little piece of one tiny little piece of the standard. It's very, very high level. And it makes us sad. Because the standards documents that we have available to us are very high level. They tell you what your site should do, but they don't tell you how to do it. It's kind of like if International Building Code specified that you must have a way to get from the ground floor to the first floor and never even mentioned the word stairs. So it's kind of impractical. The standards also have very specific ideas about what accessibility needs people have. And this is actually a relic of the fact that the standards were put together over time based on the input of people with disabilities. And the standards pay the most attention to the types of assistive technology used by the people whose advocates were the loudest. And in this case, that usually means blind and low vision users using screen readers 
Screen reader technology is very well represented in the standards, but a lot of the other needs really aren't. People have more accessibility needs than you would think. When you say assistive technology, people think of blind or low vision users using screen readers. There are a bunch of them out there. The three that are most common now are JAWS and NVDA, both work on Windows. VoiceOver works on the Mac. I'm actually not sure if there's anything that even works on Linux. I think the, okay, awesome. Uh, people think of people who can't type, uh, you know, if you uh, blow your hands out with carpal tunnel syndrome or other RSIs, you start using the dictation software. Uh, Dragon is pretty much the name in that field. Dragon naturally speaking, Dragon dictate. Or people who are unable to use the mouse using the keyboard only navigation, the mouse keys. Um, you can go anywhere from just using the tab key to move through form fields all the way up to there are setups where you can make your keyboard work in, and function entirely as a mouse. So estimates range that anywhere between 3 and 5% of the internet using population uses one of these technologies, which is you know, not really a very large number. You know, relatively speaking, you know, if you have a site that doesn't work on these, you're really only going to be losing 3% of your audience. And, you know, your marketing director might tell you, well, we don't really need that. And the yeah. problem is it's not just about screen readers. It's not just about people who are dictating. It's not just about people who are using keyboard input. So I want to throw a question to the audience here, and I'm pretty sure, you know, looking around some of your faces, I think some of you have been doing accessibility stuff for a while, so you're probably actually going to get this right. Usually people get it wrong. What is the assistive technology that is in most common use on the internet? Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody? Zoom. Zoom. The most common assistive technology is using your browser's preferences to change the font size from like 14 point to like 26 point. Large text size is the most common assistive technology on the internet. And when you say that to people, they usually look at you like, wait a minute, that's not assistive technology. You don't have to download anything for that. You don't have to install anything like that. That's easy to use. That can't possibly be assistive technology. But it is. I'm going to detour a little bit. Um, mentioned at the beginning that I work on Dreamlet Studios. It's a blogging, social network, social media platform. Um, we were a code fork from LiveJournal. And LiveJournal started in 1999 and uh, never really paid a whole lot of attention to accessibility. So in 2008, when we forked the, the project, um, we said, OK, we are going to put a bunch of attention into this. We are going to work on making the site more accessible. So we started up an accessibility project team. And they're wonderful people, and they do all sorts of great work. And we've actually gotten to the point now where uh, many of our users come to us and say, wow, yours is the most accessible website I've ever used. Um, but the accessibility project team, I occasionally go and I pull them. Like, uh, what, what else do you need? How else are you using your assistive technology, et cetera, et cetera. So about six months ago, I went to them and I said, OK, guys, informal poll here. Let me ask you, what are you using for assistive technology? And we had people who said that they were using JAWS or NVDA. We had people who said that they were using Dragon. These are the other things that people mentioned. Stylish, in order to change the CSS of a website so that uh, it was more in, in tune with what they needed. No script to turn off JavaScript. No squint, which is a Zoom extension. Uh, Flux. I don't know, have any of you guys ever heard of Flux? Yeah. It's a, um, a plug-in uh, little utility that you can install on your computer to change the temperature of the light. And it was originally designed, developed for people who have um, insomnia problems under the theory that bright light in the evening, such as when you're looking at your computer, is going to keep you from getting to sleep faster. And then other people, yes? Just because this is a Linux crowd, Redshift tends to work better. Redshift works better on Linux, thank you. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, so people use efflux in order to keep from triggering migraines because the, the bright light of the screen tends to trigger migraines in them. Uh, disabling animation so that your animated GIF doesn't animate. Um, bookmarklets to zap the CSS. Uh, disabling the autoplay. I mean, there's a huge list here. And you'll also notice if you're looking at this list that many of them are probably extensions that you guys have installed as well. Uh, you know, quick show of hands. How many people in this audience are using the ad block extension? That's what I thought. People use that as an accessibility tool if they have problems with distractibility or if they have problems with flashing graphics can be an epilepsy trigger or a migraine trigger. And you know, what's the most common source of flashing graphics on the internet? Ads. So this tool that you guys are using to block ads or possibly to block ads and for accessibility, other people are using for accessibility. So when we're thinking about accessibility, we're not just thinking about blind people, we're not just thinking about uh, hard of hearing people, we're not just thinking about people who can't use the keyboard. There's a whole bunch of people we have to, t have to think about. People who have migraines, people who have cognitive disabilities, can't pay attention to things for a long time, uh, people with trouble reading, people with dyslexia. Uh, people who are colorblind. Estimates are that, um, I think the latest estimate I heard was that uh, 9 to 10% of men have some form of colorblindness. And uh, you know, you think um, people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Well, the internet is for text, right? Well, as Sir Tim was saying this morning, video is becoming more common than text. So how do you serve all of these accessibility needs? You know, it's a really tough question. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes two separate groups will have conflicting needs and you cannot actually meet both of them at the same time. Um, an example there is uh, blind and low vision users, you need high contrast. Um, the color of the link text uh, or the, uh, the text of the main body against the background should be at a certain ratio. For some people who have a tendency towards migraines or um, certain types of uh, eye strain, eye fatigue, etc., high contrast is painful. So what do you do? Well, the temptation is to say, well, okay, I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and just like I have the regular and the mobile version of my website, I'm going to have the regular and the accessible version of my website. Don't do that. It never works. Not only do uh, you have double the development time, the two of them will get out of sync very quickly. And especially if you're um, aiming the special version just at accessibility needs, people aren't going to be able to find it. And once they find it, they're not really going to be able to know how to use it. So instead, we follow the principles of universal design. And I don't know how many people were in uh, Ruth's talk yesterday when she was going through uh, the do's and don'ts of things. A lot of what she was saying um, are basically the principles of universal design. And the reason to do this, it's a win-win situation. It improves accessibility, which is why we're talking about it now. It also it improves your cross-platform support because uh, you know if it works in one browser using these techniques, it's likely to work with others and it's also really likely to degrade well so if you have that one person who's uh, you viewing your website on Netscape 2.0 on a uh, you know 14.4 modem in outer Patagonia on a 386 if you design your website well enough and accessibly enough it should degrade gracefully for them also improves your search engine visibility because a lot of these techniques that I'm going to be telling you about um, involve putting the content primary and the visuals secondary and essentially you're trying to make it possible for a screen reader which is looking at the source um, well what, what else just looks at the source and doesn't look at the, the visuals it's the search engine robot um, it also, one thing that's not on the slide, um, it usually improves your mobile experience as well. 
So I'm going to give you a light speed tour of universal design just so we have these basic principles at hand and can use these to evaluate the actual concrete tools that I'm going to be giving you. This will not be on the exam. I will not test you because I'm going to do this really, really fast. Universal Design Principles, if you want to find out more, the North Carolina State University Center for Universal Design has articulated seven of them. They don't all apply to web design. I'm only going to teach you about the five that do. Number one, equitable use means that the design is useful to people with diverse abilities and the principle you're looking for there is identical experience whenever possible, equivalent experience whenever it's not possible to make it identical. That means that you do not have to make it exactly the same for somebody who's accessing your site with assistive tech, but it should have the exact same abilities. I'm going to turn off my email noise. Flexibility in use. That means that the design accommodates a whole range of preferences. You can make it do what you want it to do. The more open, hackable, etc., the better. Open source is really, really good at that. Except to the point where it violates point three, which is simple and intuitive use. Because sometimes when you've got all the little knobs and dials that you can twiddle, it starts getting incredibly complicated and the design stops being easy to understand. So that's also something you have to pay attention to. And you do this by making sure your design has consistency, as simple as possible, and also gives the user reliable feedback that is identical from area to area. Area. Perceptible information, uh, one thing that um, websites in general are really bad at is throwing up the error message up at the very top of the screen in that one little line that's right where the batter blindness hits so you don't notice that you've gotten an error until you keep trying to go. Um, so you want to communicate your uh, necessary information to the user regardless of their, the ambient conditions so it can't just be with a little noise alert because uh, you know if you're in a noisy room or if you're standing outside during a break you're never going to hear it, things like that. And five, tolerance for error, which means that it's very hard to break it. Um, you should provide fail-safes and warnings, make sure that uh, the design minimizes hazards, uh, that if you have a big red button that takes down your entire website, you don't put it right there for people to click. Uh, a funny story with that, LiveJournal's uh, data center, back when I used to work with them, the data center had the emergency power off switch right next to the airlock door that you needed to buzz out of. <laughs> And it was a big red button and it was exactly where you would, it was like at, at uh, hip height so if you're walking up to try and get out you would just hit the, the emergency power off and think it was the door open button. It took them four incidents before they put a guard over the, over the button. So okay, we've got these uh, you know, five basic principles of universal design, everything's just ducky, right? You know, we're just uh, chilling out, yeah. Those are really high level guidelines. If the uh, uh, accessibility standards were high level guidelines, these are really, really high level guidelines. There are checklists you can find and in the resources packet I'm going to give you at the end, I will be giving you links to the various uh, checklists on how to implement things like this, but automated checklists, um, you know, many of them disagree. You'll get a bunch of people saying, well, here is how you implement this, or here is how you implement that. And a lot of the advice is still talking about HTML4, HTML4 before we even really had CSS. These are these guidelines that were written in the late 90s, early tw uh, 21st century, and nobody ever came back to update them. Perfect example, semantic HTML. You hear all the time, uh, you know, use semantic markup. It's great. And sometimes you hear it billed as, use semantic markup because it's more accessible. There's one problem. We'll take this bit of code. It has the italic tag and it has the bold tag. You hear people saying, well, screen readers work better if you use the emphasis tag and the strong tag instead. Except, well, okay, let's figure out how do these two render. That's with the italic and the bold. That's with the emphasis and the strong. There is no difference. 
most of the screen readers out there, I think all of the screen readers out there, don't differentiate between the two. And it's not wrong. There are a lot of really good reasons to do it that way. But it's really not very much an accessibility thing. And the reason is, the screen readers don't differentiate, the web doesn't differentiate. If only a certain percentage of sites out there are making this distinction, you have to support it as though none of the sites are making the distinction, or else things are going to be broken. So I've just taken you through all that, you know, we have a problem. You are in a maze of twisty little best practices. All of them are competing. So okay, how are we going to solve this? I know, let's write automated testing tools. We'll be able to run our website through this automated checker. It will tell us what's wrong. We will go and fix it. They don't catch everything. And as a matter of fact, a lot of times what they do is they simply highlight places where you need a human decision. They can't catch everything because so much of this is subjective. So, we have a problem, that's okay, I'm going to here to throw up the accessibility bat signal. And I'm going to teach you 31 quick techniques to make your site better. And actually I put my notes for this slide on the wrong slide, so let me back up to the back to signal for a second. I want to tell you another little story. I have a friend of mine, she's a full-time screen reader user. Uh, she has a little bit of light perception left, but not much. And she's also a lawyer, she's a disability activist, she's been doing this for a while. She decided over the summer that she was going to have a, a project, and for a week, she was going to, every time she ran into an inaccessible website, she was going to write them a letter, uh, an email, and say, here is what I noticed, here is what's wrong, here is how to fix it, boom. Uh, so in seven days of reporting accessibility problems, and she was only reporting the absolute critical, uh, you know, hair on fire type bugs, because otherwise she'd be doing that all day. Um, she made 26 reports. Uh, that bunch of various uh, sites, things like her insurance company, um, you know, various, uh, like I think Netflix was one of them, um, Google was one of them, YouTube was one of them, bunch of different uh, reports. She made 26 reports. She received zero positive responses. And she defined positive response as anything from thanks, I'll fix that, to she was being very generous. She counted, or was planning on counting, thanks, I'll make sure that this gets to the developers, you know, or even thanks, we'll look into that. She was going to count that as a positive response. She didn't need to. She didn't get any of them. 25% of her responses were the total runaround. Oh, well, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure whether or not that's something we want to fix. Are you Can you explain that a little more? Maybe, uh, you know, give us a master class on accessibility for free via email. 25% of the responses she received were outright hostility. That's not a problem. Why are you saying that's a problem? Or, even better, well, our site is perfectly accessible. Dude, I just told you that it isn't. <laughs> and then the crowning glory of this project, 50% of the uh, 26 reports she made got no response. So even if, as we go through these 31 techniques, you're going to start to feel a little bit overwhelmed, like, oh my god, how am I ever going to be able to remember all of this? How am I ever going to be able to implement all of this? That's okay, you don't have to. If you just implement, like, maybe like two or three of these, or just even put up a statement on your project website saying, our accessibility statement is, if you're having problems, tell us and we will fix it. And then when you get reports, you fix it. You're ahead of pretty much everybody else. So again, um, these are the 31 tips. I'm going to go through, I'm going to explain them as I do. Um, all of these are downloadable at the end. I, I wrote you some exercises. I was hoping to be able to write more, but uh, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, but the link to that will all be at the end. Okay, so the one that you always hear, the one that's in pretty much every single web development text out there, make sure all of the images on your website have the alt attribute, the height, and the width. 
Anybody want to take a guess at what percentage of uh, images on the internet have alt text? Ten. Yeah, it's something like at between uh, ten and fifteen percent, and it's been getting higher lately because a lot of people are using um, you know photo hosting websites and the uh, click here to get the code link. And that, that, that's usually better because most of those photo hosting websites on their generated HTML uh, will at least include an alt text, an alt, the, the alt uh, text. The problem is that the alt text that these websites include are usually things like the name of the file. So here's an example of how not to do it. You, know, you have your image src, uh, image.png, and nothing else. Well, here's better. You know, you have the uh, image.png, you give it a height, you give it a width, and your alt tag is woman laughing with salad. <laughs> <laughs> I have a note down there, writing good alt text is an art. It's not a science. Um, I have some links, and the, the exercise that I gave you guys is actually about writing useful alt text. You're not going to give the same image the same alt text if it's used in two different situations. It's all context dependent. And it's all based on what you're using the image for. And speaking of that, use blank alt text for purely decorative images. If you have something on the page and it serves no function except to move something over, because you know, you're not supposed to do that. We've got CSS now, but people still do it. Don't do this. That has no alt tag. A screen reader will read this as image spacer dash left dash red dot gif. Image spacer dash left dash red dot red dot gif, et cetera, et cetera. It's really annoying. I couldn't get my demo screen reader working or I would have, uh, you know, let you experience how annoying it is. Just as annoying, however, <laughs> you've got the spacer, you think, it's a spacer, I need alt text. I'll just go ahead and describe it as a spacer. Read as image, spacer, image, spacer, image, spacer. It's really annoying. So do it this way instead. If you put in the blank alt text, it is as though the image does not exist for the screen reader. The screen reader user will thank you. That's still not the best way to do it though. The best way to do it is to use CSS to place purely decorative images and then you know, they get ignored and stuff. So use header tags in your markup. H1, H2, etc. You want to use a bunch of block level tags like that. Screen readers use them as jumping points. If you listen to a screen reader user, and again, I apologize that I don't have the video I wanted to show you. If you listen to a screen reader user um, who's been using the screen reader for long enough, it's kind of like Lieutenant Uhura on the, the bridge of the Starship Enterprise because, uh, you know, my friend Shayla, she'll be sitting there with her uh, little ear, earbud in and she'll be having a conversation with you and meanwhile in the background, like Mickey Mouse on helium is going, <laughs> she can understand everything. She's got it set at 15 speed, uh, 15 times speed. She understands everything and she only has to listen to about a quarter of a second of an element to know if that's an element she wants to listen to. Because you can skip ahead from element to element. So facilitate that skipping by putting your things in header tags. It will mean that if you have content, if the screen reader user has content that they don't want to hear, they can jump ahead. And speaking of skip links, use them. If you have something where uh, your source has a bunch of repeated information at top that never changes from page to page, and then you have the useful content, go ahead and uh, put the um, skip link at the top to bring you down to the useful content with an anchor link. And doing that will help facilitate the jumping ahead, but it also means that the screen reader user doesn't have to sit there and jump through like a bunch of different headers in order to get to it. Um, so, you know, they use the headers for navigation. You could still just get away with that, but do them a favor and save them from having to hit forward 10 times. Just put the, the skip link in instead. 
You can avoid a lot of this, however, just by carefully writing your HTML and CSS source. And I phrase this as content first and Chrome after. Uh, if you have navigation, if uh, you have a, a menu off to the side, if you have uh, the menu over the top, um, try if you can to put all of that content lower in the, in the source. And then using CSS positioning, for visual browsers, set that up into where you want it. If you want it like on the side or if you want it on the top. Uh, it's actually, it's pretty easy to do. You know, sometimes you have to sit there and like argue with CSS for 20 minutes, whatever. But by doing that, the screen reader is reading the source linearly. And so if the useful information and the content is presented first, they get to that first. And then they have all of the menu and the navigation and the login bar and etc. You can also use CSS to hide the things that are useful for a screen reader user. Because um, if you have, you say, well, okay, I want skip links on this. And your designer says, skip links are ugly. I don't want them showing on my page. And you say, but, but accessibility. And they say, but, but my beautiful design. I'm making fun of designers here, actually. Most of the designers I know are really accessibility advocates, but you know, I think most of us have been in that fight at some point in our lives. So you can actually use CSS to um, hide the things from the visual browsers so that they only display to screen reader users. You'll see some tips and techniques out there that will tell you to use display none, the CSS display none property. Um, that's actually wrong. If you use display none, most of the screen readers out there will not see the item. Um, I believe all three of the major screen readers right now do respect display none and just don't display it. Yes, in the back. Isn't there a visibility setting you can use? There is a visibility setting you can use. The support is uh, like really, really shaky. And negative margins, wouldn't that also still leave the height of the text? Negative margins can leave the height of the text. Um, what you want to do is place it over to the side and using a float. Float. Yeah. You float it to the left at like, you know, negative 99, 999 pixels. And uh, it takes it out of the visual flow, but it shows it for uh, the screen reader, which will read out that element. Excuse me. So next, write your link text, link text descriptively. And this is something that, again, web, web authoring uh, books and guidelines and documents have been telling people since the beginning of the internet, and people have not been doing it since the beginning of the web. Bad. <laughs> to manage your account, link, click here, end link. And the reason you don't want to do that is because uh, keyboard uh, navigation or screen reader users can actually pull out a list of just the links on the page so that they can like go through. And there's really no way when you pull that out of telling where the link target is. So you wind up with a list being read in your ear of click here, click here, click here, click here. <laughs> A lot of times it's very tempting to write things like that. I don't know about you, but you know, I have to really watch myself on that. So just work as hard as you can to rephrase the text. Um, make it so that ideally the link should be um, on the item that is most important if you are linking to you know, account settings. Visit, link, account, set, account management, and link to change your settings. And that means that when that gets pulled out into the giant list of links, then here all of a sudden you've got, instead of click here, click here, click here, you've got account management, payments, shop, documentation, support, etc. It, yes? Just to go back to the bad example, why not make manage your account, or you can manage your account, fewer words, 
You can, yeah. The you text can, would be manage your account. The text would be, uh, for the video, he suggests, why don't you make the link on manage your account? You can definitely do that. Um, I was writing this as, this is sort of an example that might appear in your facts or your documentation. And a lot of time, documentation writers want to do like more natural language. So instead of a bullet point of uh, links, instead you would do something like full sentences. Yeah, uh, bullet points, um, definitely good. You could, even in this sentence, you could just do manage your account and make that a link. If you're specifically trying to tell people, go here to change your settings, um, a lot of times the temptation that I've seen tends to be uh, visit account management to link, change your settings, and link. That would also work. It's not really preferred because in this case, um, you are linking to the account management page. So you want to make the link account management. Eight, don't rely on tool tips or title text. Information that you put in the title text for the mouse over tool tips is missed by large numbers of your readers. Um, you know, it's missed by people who are using keyboard only navigation. Um, it's missed by screen readers, and it's missed by many mobile users. How many people here have an iPhone or an iPad, and uh, you know, how often do you wind up like, oh my god, I know that there's an extra joke here in mm -hmm. this webcomic? <laughs> there is a uh, site out there that specifically pulls out the title text from XKCD because XKCD is read by a bunch of nerds who like to get the joke. But not every website has the thing that will, you know, pull out the title text and show it to you. You know, if you have... They finally put up m.xkcd.com, which will also just print the title text. Oh, that's nice. I hadn't seen that. m.xkcd.com uh, puts up the, um, the title text below. So which, um, with the Android browser, you can see the caption. The default browser on Android, you see the caption. I did not know that. I actually don't have an Android phone, but um, Android browsers, apparently you can see the caption. Yeah. So. Press and hold the image and you get a menu in one of those captions. Nice. See, they're trying to work around the fact that everybody uses, uh, you know, title text for additional information and it's not really accessible. So, okay, you think, well, I have this, this additional joke in the comic. Uh, you know, I want to make it accessible to screen readers. I'll just put it in the alt text. Don't do that either. The reason that you don't want to put uh, additional information in just the alt text. Alt text is accessible by screen readers. It's usually, in, I think in all of the major browsers, it's shown if you have images disabled. Those are the only ways you can get to the alt text without a special plugin or without viewing the source. So it's impossible to reach in most visual browsers. Um, you know, there are ways to get to it, but you need to know what you're doing and you need to know that you want to look there. So uh, don't rely on the alt text. You're thinking, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll put some information in the alt and some in the title and, you know. Well, there's a problem with that. The standards say that your alt text and your title text must be different. In this instance, I will tell you these standards are wrong. It's a controversial position. This is something that has been argued very, very vehemently on accessibility mailing lists. Uh, you know, if you wade into this discussion, you wind up with like that kind of verbal fist fight. Uh, but if you make the title text and the alt text the same thing, it means that people who miss the title will catch the alt. People who miss the alt will catch the title. People who miss both, you know, they're still going to be missing it. But if it's the uh, same in, in both attributes, then you have a much greater chance of not losing part of your readers. Explicitly label all your form fields. Um, I don't know how many people were in Ruth's talk yesterday, but she was talking about this. Um, if you have just a, a, you know, the label visually positioned next to the form field, that's all well and good, but the screen reader is just going down and reading the form field. So if you have code like this, um, where you have the form and then the, the name label, and maybe that's got some CSS on it to make it look pretty, and then, and then the input, when you get to that input, the screen reader is only going to read out the, the form field. 
Some of them will read the name, the, the label, which in this case is name, or not the label, will read the name. In this case, it's name. Some of them will not. You can't rely on it. So better would be to include the actual explicit label. You have the label for the name field, and then you have the actual name field. And you know, I threw in an ID equals name so that you can do some CSS with it if you really want to, you know, make it look pretty and stuff. Well, that's better. And if that's all you do, it's still going to be much better than the first version. But the absolute best in this case is this. I see you looking at that and going, wait a minute, what's that? This is an ARIA landmark role. And you're all looking very confused because I am about to introduce you to one of the best things to happen to internet accessibility since the dawn of the web. ARIA, or why ARIA? It's the Web Accessibility Initiative's Assess Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And this was created for the fact that now we have you know, all these complex, rich technologies. We have DHTML, we have AJAX, we have JavaScript, we have uh, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that's doing all of these bells and whistles on the site. And people want to use those because they're really cool and you can make your website do lots of awesome, different, responsive design things. Except how do we make these accessible? And the answer to that is, why ARIA landmark rules? All right, ARIA, why ARIA? It is a way of essentially saying to the user agent, this bit of HTML is serving this function. This is a menu. This is navigation. Uh, this is a form. This is a table. This is a label. Um, by giving things landmark roles, you are telling the user agent what function this bit of HTML and CSS is serving. And by doing that, uh, then people who are using the assistive technologies can say, take me to the menu. They can say, take me to the navigation. So client implementation is still a little bit spotty. Um, at the moment, I believe all of the major screen readers support it. Some of the keyboard um, navigation uh, plugins support it. It's getting better and better every day. The standard is still not 100% uh, you know, fixed. So occasionally things change around a little bit. But you're not gonna lose anything by implementing it because implementing it, if the user agent doesn't support ARIA landmark roles, it just ignores them. So um, I wish I had time to give you the whole overview about ARIA and why is it, it is utterly awesome. It really is the best thing since sliced bread. As a matter of fact, it's probably better than sliced bread because you can get internet access with it. Mm -hmm. In the resources I have at the end of the talk, there's a whole bunch of links to ARIA and uh, how you, the standards, how you implement it, what benefit you get from it, et cetera. So if you don't read anything else in the resources, read that section. So you're designing a website, you want it to have the bells and whistles, you want it to uh, look pretty and uh, you know, be responsive and et cetera, and you're tempted to uh, write the JavaScript to do this all on your own because it's really awesome and you want to play with it. Try to resist that as much as possible if you can. jQuery is not 100% accessible, but it's a lot better than what people write on their own to uh, achieve the same purpose. So if there is a jQuery uh, plugin or element that does what you want to do, use that instead. The jQuery team is actually really, really good at accessibility. And because it's used in so many places, you have a much wider variety of people using assistive tech having tested it, provided feedback, etc. cetera. Um, so they, they work really hard to make their stuff accessible. So use that instead of writing things from scratch. 14, make sure everything on your website has a tab index. 
uh, form fields? Have you ever been uh, tabbing through your um, um, form or whatever and you're trying to navigate through a form that you're filling out like for your credit card details or whatever and you discover that the developer has left, has somehow made it inaccessible. Uh, you can't actually enter your credit card via tab. You have to actually pick up the mouse and mouse to it. And Make sure that everything has a tab index. Tab index specifies how the tab key moves you through the elements of the page. And you can mess with it. Now I'm telling you to use this, use it sparingly because if you've got something so that uh, you know, you're jumping around from first name to credit card number to uh, city to address to state to last name, that's going to mess with the visual flow of the page. But if you load a web page and you have, say, something that does not get used very often at the top of the page as part of your navigation or whatever, um, some form field for, um, uh, like, the, if search um, on a checkout page. You load a checkout page, you're going to want to check out. You're going to want to put your name information, your credit card information, etc. in before you go and search for something else. So you put the search box lower in the tab index and uh, later in the tab index. And uh, so people who are hitting tab will move first to where you want to move them first. But don't hide any of the visible elements from the keyboard. You can take things and give them a tab index of zero. That means that you can't actually get to them via keyboard. It's really annoying. I'm going to show you actually uh, an image of the thing that's annoying me most about not being able to navigate to via keyboard right now. This is the Wikipedia article rating widget. <laughs> that is the look of a man who has been part of this argument before. <laughs> the Wikipedia article rating widget, it appears on the bottom of every single Wikipedia page. Did you find this helpful, etc. Um, you can't actually get to it by the keyboard. You have to pick up your mouse and go ahead and if you want to uh, do a star rating uh, for whether this article was trustworthy or uh, objective, etc., etc., you have to actually pick up your mouse and click one of the stars. You can't get to it via the keyboard. And there are ways that you can make it accessible via keyboard, um, usually through ARIA landmark roles and etc. Yeah, the only thing that you can actually get to um, using the, the tab in, in this widget is the what's this. So if you're a keyboard user, you can uh, find out what it is, but you can't actually use it. Flipping back to one of those things that has been in HTML authoring books since uh, the, you know, the beginning of the uh, web, never use tables unless you're presenting actual tabular data. And everybody gets told this, and these days it's a lot better because now we have uh, you know, much better CSS support and et cetera. You don't need to use tables for layout anymore. But a bunch of people will still do it because you know, they learned their HTML 10, 15 years ago. I have a friend who is uh, the librarian at a uh, she's the University of Maine system, one of their campuses. And she came to me two weeks ago and she said, I'm, I'm having this problem with our website. People are reporting that in the new daily build, the new build of Chrome, um, that our uh, course reference material is having this, this display bug. The table should stretch out across the entire uh, space and instead it's getting all compressed here. She said, and I've been looking at it all day and I can't figure out why it's doing that. Do you have time? Can you look at this? And I looked at it and I immediately knew what had happened. You know, there was a mistake in the HTML source and stuff, but I said, why are you using a table for this? Well, really, why are you using a table for this? If you've got a screen reader, it's going to read this as you'll need one of these and one of these and possibly one of these. Course reserve submission form, books, videos, CDs, and DVDs, consent form for written student work, 
photocopy sound or image file consent form for film student work. It's pretty meaningless. Instead, I told her, we'll rewrite it as a list. Give it an, an unordered list and go ahead and uh, just put, it, put in some headers. I said, uh, you know, for that, you probably want to use the H3 tag because the H1 is used already and there was an H2 on the page. <coughs> So rewriting it as that, not only does it uh, make it more accessible to screen readers, it also gets rid of her bug, so she doesn't have to uh, troubleshoot her CSS anymore for that table problem. And I happen to think that it's just like easier to read in general for everybody. So look for cases when you have something like that. There's often a temptation to, uh, you have, you're trying to present data and you think, well, this is, this is a table. Maybe I should, I'll, ma I'll make a table for this. It's tabular data. It doesn't always have to be tabular data. Even if you think you need an X and Y axis of uh, information, just try and be creative and think of other ways to present that information. Because if you can get rid of tables, the more you can get rid of tables, the better. It's not always possible to get rid of tables. You know, there are still times when you're going to need them. So if you are going to use a table, make sure that you have the table header uh, line. It's the, the TH tag. That identifies which part of text is the header of the table. And it also, you know, screen readers will use that to, to pick up, uh, you know, the table. You can ask it to tell, tell you what column you're in, et cetera. So it, you know, it does help. It's best to not use tables at all. If you have to, use the table headers and use the ARIA rules that I was telling you about. So uh, one of the other things, if you look back here on uh, the, the rewrite, you know, you've got the bullet points on the, the lists. So if you're going to use a list, use the actual list tags. Unordered list, ordered list tags. Um, sometimes you're designing something, you think you want it pretty, so you're going to just give it a bunch of links and you're going to give it a graphic bullet in front because, you know, like maybe this is the, uh, the bullet is uh, something on fire because this is a really hot link or whatever, you know, 1996 web design. You still see stuff like that. <laughs> So a lot of times, you know, the, you're writing HTML, you'll be tempted to just put the, the bullet.gif or whatever. And of course, the other reason why this is bad is because there's no alt text and there's no blank alt text. So that will be read out as bullet.gif item one. So better, use the unordered list tag, um, put in, put each link or whatever, link item, et cetera, in a list item tag. And then in your CSS, make uh, the list item tag have the image in it. And that will give you the exact same effect, but it will actually be accessible. Okay, now, I'm about to advance to a slide that is probably going to make half the room wince and the other half nod. I apologize in advance for the flame war that I am about to start up. This is one of the incredibly controversial points. When you are defining text size, when you are defining element size, if you are positioning things on your screen, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, use EM and not pixels or points. And the reason for that is if you define text with EMs, if you are essentially saying to the browser, make this element a percentage of, you know, the, the actual M character in your font. <coughs> Excuse me. So by doing that, if you load a, a page and your browser font size is something ridiculously huge, say like, I know people who browse at 48 point, that means that if you have defined your sizes, like your column width, if you've defined that in pixels, um, you know, your 48 point text will wind up being like seven characters wide or something like that. And it's fine for horizontal because, you know, horizontal is constrained by browser win uh, width anyway. 
It's really annoying if you're trying to uh, uh, define a limit for how, thi how tall things can be vertically. Uh, because if all of a sudden now you're at 48 points, your um, nice little browser window that you've got built inside the rest of your other website will suddenly contain like four lines as opposed to the 26 lines that you intended it to have. So by defining your sizes in M, you manage to tell the website to resize properly based on the text size, and you get a much more fluid design. Um, a lot of times designers will say, well, they want their, you know, they want their layout pixel perfect, they want it, things to be here, they uh, want it to look like this in all browsers and at all times. You really can't do that. You have to give up a little bit of control. One of the things that you can do is restrict large blocks of text to a narrower length. And here's where we start getting into things that you're, you know, there's a couple of puzzled looks in the audience. I can say, um, you know, well, what does that have to do with anything? Studies show that people with any form of dyslexia, reading uh, comprehension issues, or even just people who read at a lower grade level, begin to have comprehension problems the, lar the longer the line is. And particularly now when we're starting to see all of these uh, displays and stuff that are super, super huge. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but my monitor at home is like 2,400 pixels wide. And if you have a site and you're trying to read a, a large block of text on it that's going all the way across here, your eye loses track of what line you're on after about uh, anywhere between 70 and 90 characters. So you wind up, uh, you know, uh, if you ever try it, go find a website that spreads the text along uh, the entire uh, width of the browser, set your monitor to the uh, highest resolution you can, stretch your browser to full width, and go ahead and try and read that. You have to read more slowly. You have to stop, you have to go, wait a minute, where am I going in this? So it slows down reading, and it slows down reading comprehension. What we do on Dreamwith is we specify uh, that the browser window should be no wider than 80M. And that means that, yes, if you're running uh, your browser width at 2400 uh, pixels and you have your font size set to like fly spec 6, you know, it's all going to squeeze down into just like this little bit. But for the people who are having trouble with um, reading comprehension or uh, just have their, their font size set to something that's maybe just like a little bit too small for them, it'll help them. Like, I don't know about you guys, but as my eyesight gets worse and worse and worse, I just, I don't notice until all of a sudden I realize that I'm sitting here and like yes. squinting and then, oh yeah. yeah, you know, I should go and A, get my eyes checked and B, bump up my font size. There's a question. Do you mean width there? Yes. Width wrong on the sentence. You said oh, you're right. To a narrower length. I do mean narrower width. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what you mean. <laughs> Yeah, do you, do, you, do you want to know like how many times I've uh, practiced this talk too? I never noticed that. <laughs> so yes, the slide should say uh, restrict large blocks of text to a narrower width. Yes? Did you just say restrict the page to 800 pixels? M, uh, I did not. 80 M. Yes. And that, that way uh, the, the size will depend on what your uh, browser text size is. And yeah, it will annoy a couple people who are like, well, yes, I, I want to read, uh, I, I want to read this at, across, stretching across the entire page because uh, my monitor is 2400 pixels wide and I have my text set to fly spec 6 and it doesn't annoy me. These are the people that Stylish was made for. They can write their own script and produce their own CSS for your website. They're very, very much the minority. I recognize that in this audience, it may be less of a minority than they are in the wider audience, but yeah. One question. Yes. How did you come up with ADM as your target? Um, the average length of text that someone can read without eye strain uh, is between 70 and 90 characters. 
So if you set it to 80M, it is on average about 80 characters wide. Yeah, 80 column text. Um, yeah, you can, you can get more. You know, if you have a proportional font and if you have uh, a lot of uh, you know small small letters or uh, narrow letters, so you can wind up with uh, with more. And sometimes, you know, depending on your audience, if your audience tends to skew a little older, um, if you know for sure that you have a lot of people uh, with vision problems, uh, for instance, if you are serving a, a population that. Like if you if you are um, specifically an accessibility forum, if you have a lot of users, uh, such as the uh, support group for people with certain eye conditions or whatever, if you know for sure that your audience has a lot of eye strain problems or reading problems or cognitive problems, you can go ahead and set that lower. Uh, I have seen people argue for sixty. I use six. I went through this a while ago and I picked sixty after I was like. A yeah, there you go. You know, you, you pick 60 because it works, uh, you know, it all depends. And like I said at the beginning of the talk, this is the sort of thing that, you know, it's not a science, it's an art. So if you're designing something and you look at it and you're like, well, you know, 80 looks incredibly, you know, too, too wide, then you bring it down a little. If you look at it and you think, you know, 60 looks incredibly too narrow, you bring it up a little. And also, you just watch and see what kind of feedback you get from your users. So check your color contrast. The web content accessibility guidelines say that uh, for their AA uh, standard, your um, contrast should be no less than 4.5 to 1. For AAA certification, it's 7 to 1. Um, there's uh, some dispensation for bold text and larger text, like if you're over 14 uh, point, I think it is, maybe it's 16 point, um, you can uh, get away with uh, 3 to 1 for double A and 4.5 to 1 for triple A. But you want to go and, uh, you know, make things as high contrast as you possibly can. Like I see Schwern here in the audience, I'm going to pick on him actually. I yelled at him yesterday, I was uh, looking over his shoulder and watching uh, him make his slides and I'm like, that contrast isn't going to work and also, by the way, uh, your uh, color highlights aren't going to work for red-green colorblind users. He was, he was very good natured about changing things. So... You are writing colored text right now. Okay. So uh, there, there are utilities out there that will let you check the color contrast. Um, you put in the, the, um, the link text and the background text or your body text and the background text colors that you want to use and it will tell you, you know, yes, this is, uh, you know, 4.5 to 1 or no, this is actually like really low contrast. You notice I say on the slide here, if possible, offer high contrast and low contrast options or let the user set their own colors. This is one of those things that I was talking about at the very beginning where sometimes there are conflicting accessibility needs. You know, high contrast helps the people with low, low vision. Low contrast helps people who tend towards fatigue, eye fatigue, eye strain, and sometimes uh, migraine triggers. Um, I have one friend who, if she's reading something with a contrast level of like the, the 7 to 1 that they recommend, she will get a migraine usually within a 10 to 15 minutes. So she has her bookmarklets will all, you know, zap the high contrast and set them to low contrast. So depending on what kind of audience you're serving and what kind of project you're doing and etc it might make sense to let the users set their own colors like for dream with we are a uh, blogging and community website people spend a lot of time on our pages people spend a lot of time staring at our pages uh, because we um, cater to like really long large amounts of text so uh, we actually let people, for the, the journal space, we let them choose their own colors and define things and whatever they want to, you know. And some, some of them make my eyes hurt an awful lot. So we also have an override so that you can override someone else's style into your own. 
And then for our, our site skin, which uh, is the, the app space pages as opposed to the user space pages, we offer a couple of different versions. We have the high contrast version. We have the lower contrast version. And then we have the uh, version that has no large blocks of white. It is very, very common when you're designing a page to think the background of the page should be white, the text should be black. And that's great, that's really high contrast, that's great contrast, you know, you're, you're gonna, uh, you'll see actually all kinds of um, tutorials and um, um, like guidelines and et cetera, accessibility guidelines that will tell you to use black text on a white background because that's what the most greatest number of people will find readable. Large blocks of white text is one of the most common migraine triggers out there. Um, I don't know if any of you guys uh, have a LiveJournal account. LiveJournal um, recently redesigned uh, most of their site scheme, the site skinned pages. And when they did, I, I can't put my finger on what exactly is the trigger, but they increased the amount of white space considerably. Uh, white space is defined in design as uh, something that has nothing else in it. It's not actual white space. But they increased like a lot of the padding around the elements and they made a bunch of things larger and there's a lot more uh, open space, white space. And their background is pure white. And when they announced the redesign and they showed the, um, the working mock-up to people, the number of people who responded in their call for feedback saying that, I got a migraine, I mean, this triggered a migraine after using this for 20 minutes and the, the other version didn't. And the reason for that is because large blocks of pure white background is one of the most common migraine triggers out there. Um, so like a, a very pale cream, a very pale gray, and I say pale, you know, it really only has to be a couple of points different on the hex code meter. Um, I think we use like DF, DF, DF or something like that. You know, I'd have to go look it up. Um, you know, you can fiddle around with it until it is perceived as very nearly white, but even just like the tiniest little bit of difference will help. Yes? Um, how much of that is just the way they have the display set up? Because they could just tune their entire display to have a little tint to it. Easily. Could you could uh, tune the entire display to have a little tint to it? Yes. Uh, you can also use the utilities like uh, Flux or Redshift that Mary mentioned to uh, you know tune the temperature. Problem is most people don't realize that the white is what's causing the the eye strain. Yes, there in the back. It's interesting. I've, I've often had arguments with peers as to whether black or white or white or black is better, especially <laughs> when I'm coding and stuff. But I was wondering is, is white text on black easier? All right, question for the, uh, uh, the recording is white on black or black on white easier? And actually, you jumped the gun a little. <laughs> Provide both light on dark and dark on light options. It's a very long argument. It's a very old argument. Um, if you look at the actual literature and like what the, when they hook people up to, uh, you know, um, little uh, things that will take pictures of your brain. Um, MRI, thank you. Um, you know, if you hook things up, watch people's perceptions, watch their reading speed, etc. cetera. Um, if you do that, you, you, the, the res response that you get is that um, dark text on a light background will, is e technically easier to read. It can also contribute to eye strain. Um, you know, a lot of people, if they've been working for a while, I know I, I still actually miss the, uh, you know, acid green on the black background from, like, I actually find that really easy to read. But, you know, I'm a minority in that, I know. Uh, maybe not in this room, actually. <laughs> I love being among my people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very individualized thing. Um, you know, this is one of those things where um, individual tastes and preferences differ. 
I can tell you that statistically speaking, it is more likely that if you are reading light text on a black background, you will be forced to read more slowly for comprehension. And you will need to have your font size slightly larger for comprehension. This may not be a bad thing. You know, maybe you want to slow yourself down. Uh, you know, especially if you're coding. You know, I find that uh, using the the light text on the black background uh, will make me slow down and read things more carefully. But again, this is the sort of thing where it's a very individualized thing, um, and the accessibility needs can conflict very strongly. I have another friend who puts everything in the acid green on black uh, because that's le less likely to trigger her visual migraine aura. So if you can provide the option, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing where um, very individualized um, people get really passionately attached to their display preferences. I know I don't have to tell you guys that. <laughs> you know, how many people have been carting around their one resource file for, uh, you know, uh, Vim or Emacs or whatever for how many years, you know. Um, once you get it tweaked exactly the way you want it, you want like the rest of the world to obey that. So the more that you can offer the, the, the opportunity for people to have that sort of, uh, um, custom uh, version of things, the better. Okay, so now we're going to move a little bit out of the realm of user preferences and display and etc. And we're going to start talking a little bit about some, some more cognitive accessibility stuff. Use at least two ways of highlighting information that you're providing to the user when there's an error. Um, even when you're providing information to the user when you want them to compare two things that are different Remember earlier when I pulled up the slide and I was showing you uh, about the Y ARIA label? I not only turned it purple, I underlined it. Those are two of the ways that you can convey that something has changed. Here's a bunch of different ways. There are others. This is just a sampling. You can change the color. But again, you know, remember your color contrast and don't just rely on color. Uh, you can change the outline of the element. Uh, you can throw it up in a box and uh, you know, give it like a dotted outline or a dashed outline. You can underline it. Uh, you can, uh, if you have an error and that you want to call to the user's attention, you can uh, change the text around something and pop up a, uh, like a little post-it note to the side saying, error! Um, you can give it an ARIA label. There is an ARIA role for alert, and you know, that is there to indicate that, you know, hey, something has changed, this is an error, this is an alert, this is something you should pay attention to. The more of these you can use in any single uh, interaction, the better. Because, like, how many, pe how many times have you had the problem where you go to sign up for a, a new website and you, you, know, you tab through and you know, blah, 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 and it wants your phone number and you're like, you do not get my phone number because I hate the telephone. Have, who's with me on this? Hate the telephone? Yeah, yeah, like I said, my people. So I don't give them my phone number. And I, you know, fill out all the rest of the form. And, you know, sometimes if it's there for uh, shipping something, there's like 80 gajillion different boxes and you have to fill them all out and you get to the bottom and you hit submit. And it really wants that phone number. Except all it does is it pops up a little thing right at the very, very top of the page saying in teeny tiny fly spec six type, error, must provide phone number. Well, I don't know about you, I don't read anything on the top of the page because that's where they put the banner ads. So my eyes just literally skip over that section. And it's actually, it's called banner blindness, and it's very, very common. People literally do not see the things that go across the top of the screen or the things that appear on the side of the screen. Um, and actually, uh, Mary, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, call out some uh, problem here. The Ada Initiative First Fundraiser. 
um, second fundraiser. Uh, we put it up and we were like, yes, you know, we, we've uh, you know, told everybody where it is. And people keep coming to us and saying they can't figure out how to donate. And there's a donate button and it's right there. So I called my wife over and I said, you know, here, come look at the screen and tell me how, you know, here's the front page. How do you donate? And she looked at it and she goes, oh, over there. It was right where one of the banner ad units standardly appears inside of the, the screen. And people's eyes literally glaze right over it because the human brain is the best ad blocker ever invented. So if you're putting your alerts and stuff right where like a, a banner would usually appear, people aren't going to see it. So the more that you can use to indicate, hey, something has changed, here is your alert, et cetera, et cetera, the better. And then if you're filling out the form, retain the user input if there's an error. <laughs> Going back to our example of the website that wants my phone number and won't take no for an answer, you know, I spent 25 minutes filling out this form to uh, sign up for the website and uh, get you to ship the, the widgets to me or whatever, and you really want my phone number and you're not going to let me check out without it. So I hit submit and it pops the little error in the top corner of the, the website. And once I find the error and figure out why you've done this, and I look down at the uh, form again and I realize that the thing that I painstakingly spent 20 minutes filling out with my credit card number and my address and et cetera, et cetera, none of that's there anymore. That's really annoying for me. Imagine how annoying it is when you have to have the screen reader read you the whole thing and the, or dictate each bit of the form and while well, figuring out what part of the form you're even staring at. If you have any sort of accessibility needs or uh, accessibility challenges, it will annoy you even more and it's even more tedious and it's even more likely that somebody is just going to give up and walk off. So obviously it's not possible to always retain the user input after errors. There are some fields that you never want to retain, like ideally you shouldn't retain the credit card. Uh, because if you do, in the U.S. at least, I'm not sure about globally, if you retain the credit card at any point, you need to have be certified as PCI compliant, um, which is a bunch of letters that basically means you're going to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with us. Um, so you, you, you don't want to do that. Um, you probably don't want to retain the password from load to load if somebody's... Um, uh, starting to create an account. But again, if you don't retain a specific bit of information in the field, try and make it clear that you haven't. Because how many times have you had an error, you resubmit the, um, the, the, the form, you correct the error except the website has helpfully blanked out your credit card number, so you hit submit and it's like, error, must have credit card number. And then you're like, okay, now I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> so if you can retain the input that the user gave you, it's not always possible, it's not always desirable, but the more that you can retain, the easier it will be. And you'll notice that, uh, you know, that that's really not so much about accessibility for, you know, accessibility for assistive technology. That's one of those things where I'm saying about universal design where you have good error recovery. Don't change the screen without a user action. How many people have loaded a website and you know, you're reading the website and up there, up top, there's a you know, nice picture and it's got a little bit of you know, promotional text, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and you're like, oh hey, that sounds like a really good deal. I think I wanna you know, find out more about that deal. And just as you click to read more, it rotates and all of a sudden you're looking at something else. It's called a carousel. They're getting really popular. They're really lousy for accessibility. If you absolutely must do something like that, and really you should look for ways that you, know, you aren't gonna do something like that, 
If you do dynamic content, if you're changing the website without the user specifically saying, you know, here, change the website for me, find out a way to let people turn it off permanently. And uh, the example that I, that I give here actually is Google Instant. Uh, Google Instant is the, the thing where, um, you know, they, if you're um, looking at results page and you want to change your results, you go ahead and you type something else in the search box right there and it updates the search results while you're changing your text. I've done some informal accessibility surveys uh, among uh, people with, who use assistive technology regularly and I said, um, the question that I was asking is, of the entire internet, what is the one website that annoys you most? And the response that I got from over 50% of the respondents was Google Instant. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, it doesn't really work with screen readers because you know if you accidentally happen to still be in the, uh, the the search field while your screen reader is reading through the search results and you accidentally happen to like bump the keyboard or something like that now all of a sudden instead of searching for frogs you are searching for you know you are searching for key smash and it's in the middle of reading you the results but the results have just changed it's lousy for cognitive accessibility because one of the elements of cognitive accessibility is you want to make sure that your website does not change unexpectedly and when the user is not expecting it. People aren't really expecting that they're going to type in this box and something is going to change on them. <coughs> Excuse me. So Google. You know, helpfully enough, Google really does try on accessibility. Um, they try and miss a bunch of times, but they do try. So they included a uh, link at the top of the page, um, only visible to screen readers. I'm pretty sure they're using you know negative display, negative margins, uh, to turn off Google Instant for the session. You can set it in your um, Google account preferences as well. It doesn't work. <laughs> It doesn't work in at least JAWS and NVDA. And uh, it has been reported to them multiple times and they keep saying, well, it works for us. So don't do that, please. And if you work for Google, you know, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> All right, number 29. Don't use Flash or PDFs. Use plain text whenever possible. It is possible to make both Flash and PDF accessible. It's just really, really hard. And in order to teach you to do this, I would need probably two full days of session tutorial and not the hour and a half. So uh, one of the really common culprits on things like this, especially in the US, is restaurant websites. Uh, you load the restaurant website, it's this beautiful flash intro with all of the gorgeous little bits of the views of the restaurant and you just want the menu and you try and find the menu and once you can kick the menu out of flash, what does it do? It downloads a PDF file. I usually, um, I have made it a point to stop patronizing restaurants that do that and unfortunately I, that means that I have cut out a lot of really good restaurants. So don't do that. It is possible to make it access accessible. It's just really, really hard. Number 30, caption all audio and video by people and not by machines. And if you want to see why I say by people and not by machines, go to YouTube. Yes. Uh, you know, wait until uh, the, the talk, uh, the, the video of this talk is up. Go to YouTube. You were here. You knew what I actually said. See what the uh, auto captions make of it. The technology is not there yet. It's getting better, but it's not there yet. You can crowdsource your uh, captioning. You can ask your users, you know, hey, uh, put up a wiki page underneath the video, provide a caption. The next person who comes along uh, will caption it. There's a, um, forgetting the name of the website that crowdsources captioning. Amara. Amara. And Universal Subtitles? Universal Subtitles. It's the same one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, whenever you can, provide captions. 
there's a lot more deep stuff here going on, like the difference between captions, uh, closed captioning, open captioning, and subtitles. Uh, you know, how to display it. There's lots of really interesting information about how to display captions. You know, you can dig down the rabbit hole and you know, really find out about this stuff. But honestly, if you just provide captioning, on your video that was done by a real person and not a machine, you will be ahead of 99% of the internet. And uh, I'm almost out of time. Fortunately, I'm also almost out of slides. So the last slide that I have, or the last point that I have, consider alternatives to CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA, you know, the little human test, prove you're a human. Um, unfortunately, uh, Ray CAPTCHA, which is the most commonly used uh, CAPTCHA service, it's digitizing books. And by definition, the bits that Ray CAPTCHA gives you is uh, stuff that the OCR couldn't read. And then unfortunately, it also means that it's stuff that the human can't read. How many times do you load a Ray Captcha and you're like, uh, I'm sorry, there's no upside down pie key on my keyboard. <laughs> So if you can, obviously this is a trade-off. You want to have some sort of spam protection. Um, we operate a website that is the target of spammers very often. We get hit a lot. Uh, but there are other ways to do it. You can use uh, honeypot form fields where um, you, know, you give it a, a meaningless name but an informative label and tell the um, you know, to tell people who can actually see it via screen readers, don't fill this out. Um, but the bot, the spam bot, will see it and fill it out and then when you submit the form, if there's anything in the honeypot field, just discard the comment or whatever. You can use a bunch of server-side checks, um, you know, uh, did this form get submitted from the same um, uh, um, server that it was uh, generated on um, so that it's not being uh, spoofed from somewhere else. Give it a secret token, you know, did somebody uh, load this form and then submit it immediately? That's way more likely that they're a spammer or whatever. Um, you know, there's more information in the resources on how to implement some of this. The one that we really like is a service called Text Capture. Textcaptcha.com. It's a bunch of really simple things like bird, horse, um, green, and table. Which one is the color? And you type green into the little box. It is possible for computers to solve those. Wolfram Alpha is getting better and better all the time at natural language processing, but a lot of spammers aren't going to go and, you know, code specifically for that. They'll hit that, they'll go, I don't know how to solve this, and they'll go away. There's a downside to that. You do wind up um, privileging English speakers over anybody else, which, you know, not that great. But on the other hand, the image-based CAPTCHA, also privileging English speakers over anybody else because the CAPTCHAs are usually in English. And if you speak English, you are much more likely to be able to puzzle out what it really says under that twist. So again, as I said, there's more information in the resources. Finally, if you take nothing else out of this session, if you forget every single point that I have just told you, if you disagree with me on every single point I just told you, remember this. Point zero of making your website more accessible, test it yourself in the assistive technology. You know, it is possible to get it. JAWS, unfortunately, is one of the more popular screen readers. It is incredibly expensive. Freedom Scientific, who makes it, it's closed source. They do not have a developer exception. They will not let you buy a developer license. Um, so you can't really test with JAWS unless you're willing to outlay, uh, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever for everybody who wants to use it. But NVDA is free, it's open source, it's awesome, and it's really starting to get a lot more adoption. Um, so you're never going to be able to do everything that a regular user of the technology can do. They've been using it for years. They've, they're like the super power users. But you can do some very basic checks. Here are the four basic checks that you should do on any website that you are designing. Double your font size. See what breaks. Set your font size to 24 point, 30 point, 36 point. Can you use your site at these text sizes? If you can't, fix it. 
unplug your mouse. Um, before you do that, you probably want to turn on the little setting in Chrome or whatever that says that tab will actually get to links as well as to form fields. But unplug your mouse. Go through things, see what you can use, see what you can't use, see what's annoying. See, well, wow, every time I load a page, I am tabbing through these eight gajillion things first and then getting to what I want to do. You know, you can change that. Set your screen to black and white and see what's unclear, what's invisible. Um, the, if you're designing on a Mac, there's a setting in the universal access panel that will invert your screen colors. That's really awesome. You do it and you see what doesn't work. Also using that invert screen colors is a nice trick to play on somebody that you really don't like and want to see them freak out. My cat keeps stepping on the hot key to do that. <laughs> And finally, have a screen reader read you the page, see what's frustrating, see what's missing, see what you can't hear. Um, you know, the first couple times you do that, you're going to be like, going, ah, how do I make this work or whatever, you know. Um, you, first couple of times, you know, you can have the, the monitor on, but as you get more experienced with it, turn off your monitor. Or, you know, if you're using a laptop or whatever, turn the brightness all the way down and have the screen reader read it to you and see what you're missing. So thank you very much. Um, here is the link to download the resources uh, that's on my Dream With journal. So it's denise.dreamwith.org slash tag slash A11Y which is the abbreviation that people use for accessibility because accessibility is really annoying and long to type out. So if you see people talking about A11Y, that's it. Um, the slides are also going to be up on SlideShare and uh, I will include on SlideShare a link to uh, the, the overview and the resources. Um, there is a bunch of links that you can uh, go and find more information. Uh, there is an exercise on writing useful and meaningful alt text in certain different contexts. And then I have taken all of the 31 points, extracted them from the slide, and put them up there so you can just cut and paste and do not have to fuss around with the, uh, the, the slide deck in order to have those. So I guess, questions? In the back. I was just wondering if um, HTML5 has offered any new advances in accessibility? HTML5 is kittens and puppies and rainbows and everything is beautiful and nothing hurts. <laughs> By which I mean yes. Um, there is a lot of very useful stuff in HTML5 for accessibility. Um, I will not say that it is perfect. Uh, standards are still shifting a little bit. Uh, you know, the combination of HTML5 and ARIA, which are pretty much designed to go together very well, um, is beautiful. And if at all possible, you should be writing HTML5 whenever you possibly can, because it is much more accessible. I was wondering about um, web frameworks like Twitter Bootstrap and that kind of thing. Do any of them support ARIA tags or any accessibility stuff? <sighs> web frameworks, I haven't really looked into a whole lot of them. Because they all look the same. Yeah, um, you know, in general, um, without actually knowing for sure about the examples that uh, you've given. Um, in general, web frameworks have accessibility support if one of their developers cares enough to agitate for it, which means that, uh, generally speaking, I'd say probably about 10 to 20 percent of uh, the frameworks that I've seen like, will have some nod towards accessibility. Um, the more likely they are to have it is if they have uh, developers who have uh, accessibility needs themselves, uh, which actually is something that, you know, if you're working for a company and you really want your website to be more accessible, but oh my god, what do we do with this? One thing you can do is make it clear when you're hiring for front-end developers that uh, you actually, um, you have to check with your lawyer in the U.S. to see whether or not you can phrase things this way, because there's some things you can and can't say. But you can say in your job description and in your job ad that you specifically welcome people with disabilities, that you specifically welcome people who use assistive technology, um, because um, 
the you can write the job description to specifically mention those technologies. It's really sad, but a lot of developers who use assistive tech themselves for because they have disabilities will assume that they are excluded from a lot of jobs because in their experience they have been. Uh, so if you're specifically looking for somebody to do accessibility stuff, you can you know, hire somebody who is an experienced user of these technologies. So yeah, it depends it is essentially the answer. Questions? Okay, well thank you very much for coming and listening to me talk for an hour and a half.